Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. What a pleasure to see you here. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which, as you may know, and maybe you as well, is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful. We can all recite it along together on this lovely Philadelphia day. This is, as always, an exciting time at the National Constitution Center here in constitutional heaven. We announced yesterday that the 2015 Liberty Medal will go next October to the Dalai Lama. That follows the historic visit of Pope Francis to Philadelphia in September. And we are going to mark it here at the Constitution Center with a fall devoted to the history and contemporary meaning of religious liberty. We're opening a new exhibit with rare treasures of religious liberty, including George Washington's first Thanksgiving proclamation and his letter to the Roman Catholics and Jews and Baptists of America. We're going to have symposia and discussions about religious liberty all fall, and it's going to be a thrilling time. We have also just opened a wonderful exhibit that I hope you'll stop by and see on your way out called Speaking Out for Equality. It talks about the history of LGBT rights in the courts, and it opens just weeks before the Supreme Court will hand down an important decision about uh, same-sex marriage, and that is a very uh, great opportunity for debates as well. Our traveling town hall series continues. I've just come back from New York City where the night before last, and some of you were there, we had a phenomenal debate co-sponsored by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society about whether or not NSA metadata surveillance is unconstitutional. Michael Mukasey, the former Attorney General, debated Deborah Perlstein of Cardozo Law School. Uh, General Mukasey won the debate because he experienced a 10% raise in support for his constitutional position, but a majority nevertheless favored uh, De uh, Deborah Perlstein's position, so it was a wonderfully balanced bipartisan debate. And these town hall debates are going across America next fall to Grand Rapids and Chicago and San Francisco, and they're very exciting indeed. And finally, here in Philadelphia, we've got some great events coming up. Uh, on July 8th, our Supreme Court review. Ladies and gentlemen, the court this morning issued a series of really important decisions, including one holding that Texas does not have to display the Confederate flag on its license plates. We'll be discussing that in our We the People podcast this afternoon, which we'll publish uh, later today. All month, we're talking about the Supreme Court decisions, and we will review them on July 8th with Erwin, Ch Erwin Chemerinsky and Fred Lawrence. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for a really wonderful discussion, and I am so pleased to introduce, for the first time, a very special uh, guest moderator. Uh, this is my good friend, Alexander Hefner. Uh, Alex uh, Alexander is the co-host of what is the longest running show on public television. It has been running for almost 60 years because Alexander Hefner's grandfather, uh, Richard Hefner, who was a dear friend and really one of the great communicators, scholars of public broadcasting, and interviewers of all time, who just uh, passed away last year, he ran that show for almost 58 years. And this is one of the great figures of American life, a public intellectual, a dear, decent man, a great friend. I'm, I'm so honored to take this moment to mark his memory. It's, he's badly missed, but Alexander, uh, he would be so proud, has taken up the torch and is continuing to host the Open Mind on Public TV, which will host its uh, 60th anniversary soon. Check out the Open Mind website and you will see the first shows dating back to interviews with Martin Luther King and Albert Schweitzer in the 1950s. It's an extraordinary run. Uh, it's great to welcome him to our stage. He has a distinguished uh, background. Before becoming host of the Open Mind, he uh, founded Scoop uh, 08 and Scoop 44. He's written for the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post. He's a Fitzwater Fellow at Franklin Pierce University for the next presidential campaign and co-author of a documentary history of the United States. And he will be interviewing our great scholar today, David Sahat. Uh, Professor Sahat is a cultural and intellectual historian of the US. He teaches at Georgia State University. Uh, he writes broadly on American intellectual, political, and cultural life. He's the author previously of The Myth of American Religious History from Oxford University Press, which won the Frederick Jackson Turner Award 
from the Organization of American Historians, and we hope to get him back for our Religious Liberty Focus in the fall. And today he joins us to discuss the Jefferson Rule, how the Founding Fathers became infallible and our politics inflexible. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Alexander Hefner and David Sahat. David. Alexander. It's great to meet you. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, and uh, on behalf of the center and, and Jeff, I just want to thank him for his acknowledgement of my grandfather, too. Um, David has written a wonderful book. I don't know if you read The Inquirer this past week, uh, but there was a story, an anecdote that he recounted um, that really gets at the heart of, I think, what he's trying to illuminate here in, in um, it's a narrative historiography, um, but before going any further, David, I want to ask you, what is the Jefferson Rule? <laughs> uh, the Jefferson Rule is the idea that all of our politics must in some ways be tied to and justified by the Founding Fathers. And it's a rule that um, I'm a historian and I've read um, pretty much all of American political history that I can get my hands on. And it's a rule that's been operative for almost all of um, American politics and it's operative today. Um, and, and, and you referenced this, this um, Inquirer story. Um, when, when the book was coming out, I was invited um, by a, uh, a group to Dallas. And, um, and they said they wanted to bring me out and, and, uh, and, and, and have me address uh, a group of donors. And I thought, fantastic. And I went to the website and uh, found on their Twitter feed that they had quoted Jefferson. Um, and and that, that's great. I love that. Except that in this case, um, the quotation was entirely fabricated. Uh, it was a, a quotation that you see kind of circulating in, in, in various political circles. And so I was kind of concerned, and the more I read, the more I realized you know, this group is, 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 is kind of ideologically rigid, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned that maybe they don't understand what my book is about. So I went through some sort of tortured struggle, and then I decided, well, I'll accept. And, and I wrote them and said I'd love to do it. Uh, but just to make sure, you know, this is the argument of my book. And um, I never heard from them again, radio silence. <laughs> and I think that's, that's illustrative of, of the rule, because the, 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 the problem that I have with the rule is that it shuts down political debate. And that the, 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 what happens when a politician says, the founding fathers thought, fill in the blank, uh, means I'm right and you're wrong and you're dangerous. And so I'm going to resist you at all costs. And I think we saw that in that, in that incident. Well. Uh, as a very structured, coherent historian, your uh, concluding sentence of this first chapter, this introduction, uh, really is the essence of the thesis. Uh, to just expound, you write, in the end, Jefferson's triumph consolidated the founding moment and handed to his successors an interpretive stance toward the founding era that would become the norm. He rhetorically turned the founding era into one of political purity that he himself had channeled. First, first of all, Jefferson as pure. Mm -hmm. We could ask our friend Annette Gordon-Reed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But seriously, he was a man of, of nuance, and he was a tortured soul in mm -hmm. some respect. So before even reading the last sentence, or the, the second to last sentence of this paragraph, the norm and a departure from that norm as antithetical to the values of this country. So in its purest form, what was the norm? That Jefferson was appealing to, or that? What was the, what was the, what was the precedent? You know, we, th we talk about Washington as setting precedents, but right. you're arguing, really, yeah, it's Jefferson. that in terms of the political and public discourse of this country, it was Jefferson. Yeah. Yeah, when, I, um, when I first started sort of getting concerned about the way that the Founding Fathers were being used in, in American political debate, I'd, I'd finished my first book. And my first book, 
I had them, I had read a lot of the founding fathers, and I, and, 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 and about that time the 2009 Tea Party began, and I thought, where is this coming from? Because many of the invocations of the Founding Fathers didn't accord with, with what I knew about the Founding Fathers. So I kind of read back, and I read all the way to Jefferson, and what I found was that in other debates with the Founding Fathers, what Jefferson had done was he was the very first to wrap himself in the Founding. He spoke of the true principles of the Revolution. He said that his opponents were engaged in political heresy while he was uh, uh, affirming political orthodoxy. He used things like, uh, or phrases like, our political creed. Um, and what happened was when he successfully won and uh, came into the presidency in uh, the election of 1800, he took this pattern of wrapping politics in these founding principles and he kind of um, made that a, an essential part of American political debate. And from that point forward, what happened was that uh, people would fight over Jefferson because it was Jefferson's party that, that became the single party system from 1800 to 1824. And then once the founders had died off, then they just referred to a kind of unified founding fathers that was supposed to justify policies in the present. And it was really Jefferson that started that with his election in 1800, and we still see it today. To continue now, henceforth, if Jefferson had his way, American politics would be fought by seeking a connection to Jefferson and through him to the founders. Any innovation would, of necessity, require politicians to show that their policies were in line with the principles of the past, and it would go without saying that a departure from Jeffersonianism, now equated with the principles of the founders, and mm -hmm. dare I say freedom mm -hmm. or liberty, represented the beginning of a national degeneracy. Mm -hmm. But Jefferson himself was nuanced. So from the 1820s onward, do right. you think the nuance was diluted into this kind of I see. nebula um, of liberty? You know, I would say actually more strongly that Jefferson was tortured and contradictory. Jefferson was uh, a proponent of, of, of small government and uh, a proponent, he would say, of, 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 of liberty which was protected by the states as opposed to the federal government. But once in power, he became a nationalist. He uh, adopted wholesale many parts of his opponent's political system. So much so that, that when people talk about Jefferson, sometimes they talk about the political sphinx. Sometimes they talk about, um, they, they ask what, what are the principles that he believed in because there's almost nothing that he didn't sort of contradict himself uh, at one point in time or, or, or another. And so even if you kind of reduce the Jefferson rule to trying to apply the principles of Thomas Jefferson, it's nearly impossible because Jefferson changed his mind, he contradicted himself, and there's no kind of set set of principles that you can get a hold of and say, this is what it is that I'm, that I'm defending, this is the true principles of the nation. And therefore, in contemporary times, that that's why it's so difficult and, and why you expose mm -hmm. um, not necessarily hypocrites, but, but the unreasoned yeah. or less reasonable justifications in employing the founders or Jefferson specifically. Mm -hmm. Just to backtrack a bit, I'm interested in how you carry forward this from Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. So if we were to take it step by step, yeah. how is Jefferson transmitted um, or transposed, if you will, in, in, the, in the tenure of Andrew Jackson? So Jackson is an interesting figure because Jackson, as, as, as some of you may know, came um, into kind of public life as a general. He ran for presidency in 1824 and he lost, even though he won the plurality of the vote the popular vote and the electoral college vote. He lost because when there's no majority in the electoral college, then the vote goes to the House of Representatives. And in the House, the House picked John Quincy Adams and Jackson was outraged. Jackson then spent the next four years um, kind of cultivating uh, a political persona as the heir of Jefferson. And he came into office then in 1828 at pro proclaiming that he was gonna defend Jeffersonian principles. But what happened was almost immediately Jeffersonianism fragmented and there were parts of, of uh, Jackson's party led primarily by his uh, vice president, John uh, uh, C. Calhoun, who took Jeffersonianism as a defense of um, nullification, uh, the ability of states to nullify federal law, and ultimately as a defense of southern slavery. And Jacksonianism then fractured and the nation began to um, kind of careened toward war. And this, uh, this happened most 
um, clearly in the nullification crisis of 1830, where you see both Jackson, John C. Calhoun, and the nationalists of the period all invoking Thomas Jefferson to wildly different ends. John C. Calhoun said Jefferson was the one that came up with nullification. Jackson said Jefferson is a nationalist and you're betraying him. And then the, the nationalists of the period who would soon become the Whigs said the founding fathers were uh, consolidationists. They were nationalists much more stronger than even Jefferson. And you are all uh, betraying him. And the, the, the nation entered a period of constitutional crisis that would, that would really uh, continue all the way up until uh, the Civil War. Do you, just stepping back, do you attribute his status, Jefferson's, mm -hmm to the authorship of the Declaration? Or is, in terms of being, in the, being poised mm -hmm. to almost usurp intellectually and, and, and in terms of the prominence of the statues, um, I Washington? Mean, well, so the, dec the Declaration is important, but I, uh, I actually attribute Jefferson's prominence to actually um, the formation of political parties. Because when he won the election of 1800, the opposing party was the Federalists. And the Federalists essentially disappeared. Um, they they uh, were utterly obliterated and went into decline. And there was no more Federalists by um, 1812 or so, or, or, or shortly thereafter. And what happened was the, that, that was the end of the first party system. And then with the beginning of the second party system, where you have the National Republicans and then the Democratic Republicans, which was the, um, the party of Jackson, both of them looked back to Jefferson as the, the original heir of their party and the one that they were defending. And then when the um, National Republicans became the Whigs and then the Whigs went away, then the Republicans, which is the heir of present day Republicans, they too, and this is the party of Lincoln, went back to Jefferson and said, we are the true heirs of Thomas Jefferson. And they invoked the Declaration of Independence and said, the Declaration clearly says that all men are created equal and that's why slavery is bad. And so it's, it's a little bit of, of the Declaration, but it's even more this kind of party dynamic that, that, that emerged in the antebellum era. And I, and I trust that gets more complicated with Lincoln as, yeah. as you write. But I'm interested now in your attribution of, to political parties here, pointing to the formation of these parties. Because the, the one area in which your thesis validates Jefferson in a sense. And when you read about the way that you, you, you write that, um, and I, I learned this in the book, Andrew Jackson, in challenging the second Adams, Quincy, employed some of the same tactics yeah. that Jefferson did to ensure that John, Quincy's father, mm -hmm. was a one-termer. Right, yeah. And, and I found that fascinating, but it was really, in the pursuit of power that both Jefferson and Jackson, it seems, use tactics that we might deem today as yeah. uncivil. That, no, that's exactly right. I, when I see, um, you, you know, I've read a lot of, of American political debate. When you see the founding fathers come up, uh, what you see often is people out of power who are criticizing those in power, and they're using the founding fathers as a political weapon. And um, it's a very, very useful and very, very powerful political weapon because what it suggests is that your opponents don't have different policy visions or different priorities, but they're fundamentally, fundamentally uh, usurping the, the foundational principles of the nation. And so the, 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 the chief response is massive political mobilization, resistance at all costs, and ultimately coming into political power. And so in almost every case, and you see it's, this is very, very clear before the Civil War, when politicians are talking about the founders, they're not just using it as a political weapon, but it's a kind of a symbol of deep political dysfunction. And it's a kind of a, a way of trying to get power so that they can install their own vision. And Jefferson wasn't the cure of that no. political dysfunction. No, Jefferson was in many ways the cause of the political dysfunction, <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's the irony of, of the situation. Uh, I thought maybe we'd pause before looking at Jefferson through history. We've gone from Jefferson to Jackson and we might take a you know, stop in, in mm -hmm. Lincoln and ultimately Roosevelt in the contemporary times. But, but I want to just get this 800 pound gorilla out of the way. <laughs> Is there any way in the contemporary climate, I was asking you in the green room, and you were mulling it over, that 
our politicians can be accountable for greater rigor in their <laughs> understanding or evaluation of Jefferson and, and uh, if there are any circumstances under which you would accept attribution uh, and um, without you know, historiography or mm -hmm. a scholarly paper, um, are there any politicians now who you think are doing it right? No. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, stick no. With the, we'll, we'll stick with the we'll stick with the past. Um. And, and the reason why, though, is that that, that one thing that you, you learn if you read the founding fathers, and, and you see it just immediately, is that they were in deep, deep disagreement with one another. The, the founding era was the most partisan era short of maybe the, the Civil War era in, in American political history. And so the, the, the sentence, the founding fathers thought, fill in the blank, is in almost every case false, just, just flat out. And the ways in which, if you said the founding, that you could kind of intellectually say that, the founding fathers thought that um, women shouldn't be part of the political process, that would be true, but you would never hear anybody say that. Uh, the founding fathers thought that political parties are bad, that would be true, and then they formed the first political parties. And so there's almost no scenario in which, in a kind of soundbite of modern politics, mm -hmm. that, that you could ever utter that phrase and it have any kind of intellectual credibility. What about our jurists? Do, do they have intellectual credibility? I would never impugn the intellectual credibility of a jurist. <laughs> um, but Especially not here. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but this is the interesting thing, is that it, it, part of the reason that the Founding Fathers have continued political salience and, is, is the Constitution, and the Constitution remains with us. But the Constitution is different than the Founding Fathers, and, and one of the central points of disagreement between the Founding Fathers was over the true meaning and proper mode of interpretation of the U.S. Constitution. And so, in a way, if we're going to debate the Constitution, let's debate the Constitution. But in a certain sense, the Founding Fathers aren't the place to solve that, because they deeply disagreed about it as well. Mm. Well, we might point to two departures within that disagreement where uh, a persuasion that uh, might have been opposed to Jefferson's um, prevail, mm -hmm. Lincoln and Roosevelt. Um, and obviously, the Republican Party, in many sense, became the Democratic Party by the time Roosevelt served his four terms. But take us through that voyage mm -hmm. of Jefferson as political hero, or to some maybe villain, as we move mm -hmm. now from the antebellum to wartime. So, you know, when the, when the Republican Party was formed, this is in 1854, and it was after the, uh, the Whig Party had dissolved under the pressures of what would become the Civil War. And the Republican Party was the party of, of, of anti-slavery, and in particular, the party that, that wanted to limit slavery from the Western territories. And that party explicitly looked back to Thomas Jefferson as its um, kind of founding father. Um, but their Thomas Jefferson was the anti-slavery Thomas Jefferson, not the, the Thomas Jefferson that owned slaves. Um, and, um, and, and so that party then um, was eventually led by uh, Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln was obsessed with the Founding Fathers. He, he referred to the Founding Fathers in, in speeches all the time. He referred to the Declaration of Independence all the time. And his Founding Fathers were anti-slavery visionaries who wanted to limit slavery who didn't want to necessarily uh, abolish it overnight because they didn't see a way to, but who wanted to limit it and then eventually have it kind of go away. And um, going up to the Civil War, Lincoln pressed this argument over and over and, and, and over again. Uh, and under the pressures of war, what happened was, um, once the war began, he kept saying, you know, I want the Union as it was. And then once he issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, suddenly he, he stopped talking about the Union as it was. And he started saying things like, I want a new birth of liberty. He said that, of course, in the Gettysburg Address. In 1862, when he was planning the Emancipation Proclamation, he said, the quiet dogmas of the stormy past are inadequate to our, uh, the, quiet, the dogmas of the quiet past are, are inadequate to our stormy present. We must think anew, and we must act anew. And that kind of turn toward um, 
self-determination in the present, the, the ceasing of looking to the founding fathers that became characteristic of post-war American political culture. And you saw that especially in uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt, you may remember, came uh, into office during the Great Depression. And what he said in his uh, Democratic nomination uh, acceptance speech is, let us all here constitute ourselves prophets of a new order. That, that was the kind of the bookends of this moment which was a departure from the Jefferson rule where politicians basically stopped looking to the founding fathers because after the experience of war, they started to believe that founders rhetoric was dangerous and wasn't gonna help anything. And you see a kind of whole different kind of political debate. And that would eventually go away um, during the uh, Roosevelt administration when he faced uh, significant criticism from conservative um, um, activists. And then he began to talk about the Founding Fathers as well, and thereby began a kind of modern fight over the Founding Fathers that's still with us. National renewal. I'm glad you said connected Lincoln to Roosevelt. There was something in terms of our own salvation and uh, the way in which uh, Roosevelt revolutionized uh, in that span of time. Politics, there was, there was a, a yearning for certainly solidarity, a, a leader who was, who was not going to flail in the wind like Herbert Hoover, but the absence of the Jefferson rule or the deviation, aberration, uh, is it too simplistic to say that there was a grave depression, yeah. a great depression, and that instead of searching into the lexicon of Thomas Jefferson, we created a new lexicon. Is that the way we should interpret it? Is that the um, way you interpret it? I would say that, that actually, in some ways yes, and in some ways no. I would say that Franklin Roosevelt was the heir to progressivism. And progressivism was a political movement that began at the beginning of the 20th century. And if you go back and you read progressives, um, what you find is that they believed that the nation had changed so dramatically by the beginning of the 20th century that the founding fathers couldn't possibly speak to the condition of the nation as it existed in their present. You know, this was a, a, an America of skyscrapers and of, and of deep industrial concentration. And Roosevelt uh, took that progressive impulse and when, when, when confronted with the problems of the Great Depression, took it even further and said that, uh, you know, not only is our, is our um, kind of nation physically different, but the, the, the economic structures, uh, our entire pattern of life, it, it, it's, it's not possible to look to the Founding Fathers for answers. And so he used that opportunity to then uh, but he never, said it. he never said to the nation, it's not possible to look to the Founding Fathers for answers. But you cited the quote yeah. that you read here when you came to the center. Mm -hmm. oh, we're talking uh, Theodore. Oh, you're talking Roosevelt. Theodore. I was, I was okay. thinking, I was talking Franklin. The genesis Roosevelt. of, yeah. okay, well, I, I wonder how that transformation occurred because you're saying it began with Theodore. I'm saying it began after the Civil War, be, it got taken up by Theodore Roosevelt. In what we consider the progressive exactly. age. Exactly. And then, and then was moved forward in the New Deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But do you think that there was a um, palpable, based on what you, what you read in uh, the oratory of, of Roosevelt and kind of Which the one culture, are we talking about? So FDR. FDR. Let's, FDR, let's okay. do TR. Let's do TR and okay. FDR. All right. In in the in the um, the sort of cultural milieu, yeah. that, and 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 the sickness of the country, mm -hmm. uh, it it uh, incited a new formula, mm -hmm. which did grow on the legacy of progressivism from TR's age, mm -hmm. but um, the pendulum that was the swinging away from the, the Jefferson rule. This is where I, I find it particularly interesting. Was it swinging towards Hamilton? Was it oh, swinging towards Adams? Uh, we, I wanna talk about this because in recent years there's been a, a thanks to David McCullough, and right. Tom Hanks, HBO series, <laughs> uh, there's, there's been a, a 
uh, revitalization of Adams, if right. you will. So yeah. uh, was FDR, of course, the folks on, on talk radio of mm -hmm. the era would say it was you know, Bolshevik and mm -hmm. what preceded that, but was, was there to the Jefferson rule for FDR another kind of rule that could be uh, legitimately couched in, in historical terms? Um, I don't think so in the sense that, I mean, so Hamilton and, and Jefferson are, are often the two founding fathers that are, that are contrasted. And, and in popular imagination, you know, Jefferson is the small government uh, uh, Republican and, and Hamilton is the, the kind of the big government Democrat in 17, you know, 90 or, or, or whenever. Um, but the problem there is that that, that that kind of imperfectly works because, um, you know, it's just a vastly different era. And if you go back, what, what Hamilton was talking about in many ways was uh, supporting capitalism. He, he was at the very beginning of this capitalist revolution and at the beginning of the industrial revolution. And so in certain senses, he kind of looks like a, like a, like a Republican uh, and in other senses, not. And if you go back and you look at Jefferson, um, in many ways, he's, he's an agrarian and he's, he's, he's in some ways very anti-capitalist. Um, and so I, I get kind of, concerned when, mm -hmm. when, um, when people wanna, wanna kind of bring these figures in the present and say, well, wasn't you know, FDR kind of more Hamiltonian? I, I don't think so because Hamilton is just so different and he lived so long ago and the issues were, were, were so different. I, I like to think that the beginning of um, New Deal uh, government is something very new and I like to take- His um, creation. Yeah, and I, and I like to take um, um, FDR at, at, at his word. He considered himself a prophet of a new political order, and I think he created that new political order. Well, and so bold and persistent experimentation. Yeah, And exactly. remember, he, you know, as Richard Hofstadter points out, he wanted the survival of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and often, as you testify to later in the book, in the examination of the Tea Party and the current occurrence within the contemporary GOP, uh, you would think that FDR wanted to obliterate right. capitalism as right. we know it. He right. wanted to enable it competition, mm -hmm. real competition. Mm -hmm. uh, so in answering that question, I think you're saying to all of us that it's not fair to say that there was, a, there was an Adams rule or a Hamilton rule, yeah. but in the context to keep this lively and timely, Alexander Hamilton, soon to be removed from the $10 bill, <laughs> uh, would that, would that uh, I was gonna ask you if that would be justified, <laughs> but, but uh, seriously, when, uh, Contemporary policymakers get involved in decisions like that. Mm -hmm. how, did, how does it does it phase you? What what is uh, whether <laughs> Hamilton should or shouldn't be involved? I think the latest um, is that he's going to share it with a woman. I don't know why the woman couldn't have it herself, but you know the, the, that's on the level of um, in, in a certain sense. I, I, I'm inclined to sort of dismiss that as not very important, you mm -hmm. know. And then in another sense, it, it is important in the sense that um, it's symbolically. Important. Important and um, uh, we revere the founders and the, the kind of the fact that they they appear in sort of standardized form on all our money can make us uh, believe that they were kind of all basically the same and, and in agreement. Mm -hmm. And so um, you know, if you're asking me as a citizen, what, what do I what do I think should happen? I support the diversification of our money. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, there's only so many bills to go around, and so. So then, how do you explain if uh, born out of FDR's four, four terms was a, a radical departure? Yeah. How do you explain um, the pendulum turning turning back from LBJ through Reagan, mm -hmm. uh, despite the Great Society, despite yeah. the fact that LBJ was working from the Roosevelt rule. Right, yeah. Right, I mean, LBJ didn't justify the Great Society under a different criteria than mm -hmm. Roosevelt and, and claim the mantle of the founders. Mm -hmm. There was a new history. Right. And ever since he shook Roosevelt's hand in Texas after the Dust Bowl, he was marching forward. So what happened between, in terms of our rhetoric and culture, between Roosevelt and Johnson, and mm -hmm. then ultimately Johnson and Reagan. I mean, I think the most important thing was um, the growth of conservatism, which began in the New Deal era. And the, the conservatives that I'm talking about were, were among the richest uh, men in the nation. There were, it was the DuPont family, the head of the, uh, um, um, 
G, I think G GM, um, and uh, th they formed together in, in what's known as the American Liberty League. And the American Liberty League, I went and I, I read their, their planning documents. And as these men were, were forming the American Liberty League, what they were concerned about was that Roosevelt was turning to socialism. That, that was forthrightly their, their concern, and that the New Deal was nothing other than socialism under another name. And but, were they using Jefferson to? No, 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 well, was, not yet, not yet. Uh -huh. Not in the planning documents. But what they did say was they said, that um, we don't want to refer to the protection of property, though, because that would be stupid in a, in a time of Great Depression. You know, that's going to turn off the common man. And what we need is we need a mass movement. So what we can do and what we need to do is make this an issue of the Constitution. And, and, and this is all in these documents. And, and they said, you know, parenthetically, of course, we actually do want to change the Constitution. We want to repeal the 16th Amendment, which allows for an income tax. But for our purposes right now, we don't want to change the Constitution. We revere the Constitution. We protect the Constitution against its enemies. And we are going to use the Founding Fathers. And so what you saw when the American Liberty League was formed was this constant reference to the Founding Fathers. And the American Liberty League, of course, lost, and it disbanded by, by uh, 1940. Um, but the kind of um, sons of these businessmen continued, and they began looking around. They continued on a kind of uh, lower level. And in the 1850s, they found Ronald Reagan. And Reagan was, a, um, at that point, a kind of a, a, a faded B-list actor. He was the head of General Electric Theater. But he was a, a, a superb communicator, and he was becoming more and more conservative. And in 1964, with um, the beginning of, or kind of toward the end of the Goldwater campaign, they found Reagan, and they said, we want you to give a speech in support of Barry Goldwater's candidacy. And he gave a very famous speech that was broadcast on national television called A Time for Choosing. And this is the beginning of the, the modern uh, 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 conservative concern for the Founding Fathers. Because if you go back and you listen to that speech, it's on YouTube. You can just type in Reagan, A Time for Choosing. And you, 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 you see a very, very powerful Jeremiah in which Reagan is saying the Founding Fathers had certain principles We've departed from those principles, and now the nation is headed toward ruin. And um, Goldwater, of course, lost disastrously. But Reagan was a shining star. And with the ascent of Ronald Reagan, uh, that became an ascent of kind of founder's rhetoric in American politics. And by 1980, when Reagan came into the office, the uh, conservative um, uh, obsession with the Founding Fathers was more or less complete. So you're telling us there was a second set of Sons of Liberty. There was, yes. <laughs> and they were rebelling against Roosevelt. And they were rebelling against Roosevelt using uh, the sort of the Jeffersonian tactic of invoking the Founding Fathers, exactly. Hmm. How have your peers in the field responded to this thus far? Um, uh, well, you know the way that academic discourse works is that you uh, publish a book and like two years later you finally get some reviews in academic right. journals. So they haven't responded yet. <laughs> well, I, I asked because on the show that I hosted, I had Tom Foster, who you might have had some exchanges with, who also wrote a book uh, that, in a, in a sense, humanizes the founders, Sex and the Founding Fathers. So do you see your ultimate objective here um, as enhancing political discourse of the present through a richer adaptation uh, in, the, in the way that we're um, retracing the roots? Of, yeah. these, of these men. Yeah, I mean, I'm an historian, so I believe in the political relevance of, of history and, and of the past. Not just political relevance, just the relevance of history in the past. Um, but I'm concerned about the way in which I hear history, in, kind of pseudo-history often, um, in American political debate. And so what I'm trying to do is, is to, to, to offer a history here that says, look at the long um, pattern of dispute over the Founding Fathers. What are its consequences? And I think if you, if you look at this long pattern of dispute, what you see are the consequences are negative. The, the, that founders' rhetoric generates uh, hardened political sides. That founders' rhetoric comes along with intellectual dishonesty. That founders' rhetoric kind of debases uh, American political debate. And so um, the, 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 the end goal, of course, I can't stop politicians from, from doing whatever they want to do. Uh, but so long as, as the, the, this, this rhetoric works, it will be used. And so I want to point out you know, maybe why it shouldn't. Well, I don't know if you folks follow PolitiFact. I think the Inquirer has a relationship with PolitiFact. But the St. Pete Times, formerly now the Tampa Bay Times, founded. You could do a, a, a PolitiFact. Politi yeah. politi 
geared around um, when Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush <laughs> invokes the mm -hmm. founders, but there's not a credible basis on which right. they're doing yeah. so. I think it's something maybe to consider. And you talk here you know, about a fantasy politics. Mm -hmm. Before we take questions, my last one is, so if Jefferson himself was debased or debasing, and um, when, we, when we look at the US Congress today or President Obama uh, and see the modern manifestations of the Jefferson rule, mm -hmm. uh, where, do you, where do you see it most problematically? And where do you see the opportunity to uh, resurrect some some real history? Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I, I think the the Jefferson rule reaches its most disturbing uh, terminus when you you know you see militia groups out in the Southwest uh, saying that we've so fundamentally departed from the founding fathers that that uh, that they create their own flag and they're leading secessionist movements. Um, And, and I guess I'm not sure that I trust any modern politician to do history. And so I, I suppose I would just say, I would love it if they would stop. And then we could debate our policies in, in the present and just keep the, the debate about policy rather than the past. Hmm. So let's take a question here. Can you discuss the ways in which citing the founders is important to our founding story. In other words, the way that the founders clarify and bind us together rather than distract and divide. Oh, I see. Um, you know, the, the founding fathers are um, like, like many things, like the flag, I suppose, like the Constitution, uh, or they can be uh, symbols of, of national unity. But I, I, I think that if you, if you see how the founders uh, are represented often in political debate. They're they're not images of national uh, unity or symbols of national unity. They're they're, they're political weapons, and um, I suppose I'm uncomfortable with the idea of people as symbols um, because I don't think people make very good symbols, uh, and and so if we're looking for symbols of national unity, I think I would propose that we go with the flag or we go with uh, the Constitution, an impersonal object. Uh, rather than people who we're often inventing in order to make them appropriate symbols for whatever it is that we want. Mm -hmm. um, another view, uh, viewer, <laughs> listener. They're, they're uh, viewing. Viewing, too. The founders never thought they had all the answers. So the real question is what they expected, told future generations to do. So I, I guess what you were saying in your last answer is it's unhelpful to, as we as a society seem to ceaselessly do, what would Jefferson do? Mm -hmm. What would Adams do? Um, those, are those questions unhelpful? I think those questions are unhelpful because um, um, how would you know? I'm not sure I would know. That's, that's the thing about people. I'm not sometimes sure what would my, my wife would do. Um, uh, I don't necessarily know how I would know what somebody who's been dead, you know, 200 years uh, and, would do. And isn't an argument possibly to, to expound on that, that sure there was the Enlightenment and Magna Carta but, mm -hmm. uh, and Mayflower, but these men saw their own imperfections and in order to create a more perfect union, they they innovated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did their own thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, I go back to the Constitution, and what, what you know, the Constitution, as, as you know, begins "We the People," and the the thing about "We the People" is it's it's always changing, and it's not "We the Founding Fathers," it's it's, it's "We the People," and so in a certain sense, if you if you if you want to think, well, what would the Founding Fathers do? I still basically don't think that you you can really answer that question. Uh, but if you start with the premise that they created a constitution, they, they, and the authority of that constitution comes from the people themselves, and the people is ever renewing, then uh, one answer to that question would be, we the people would solve the problems of the present, whatever those problems would be, and however distant those problems are from whatever problems existed in 1787 when the constitution itself was uh, created. And um, I like this idea of, um, 
uh, uh, put forward by this, this uh, law scholar at Yale, Jack Balkin, and it's called Framework Originalism. And um, what Balkin says was that the Founding Fathers, through the Constitution, created a structure for politics and a structure for problem solving. And then the Constitution doesn't mean kind of anything that, that, that we want it to mean. I mean, we still have elections for presidents every four years. We still have uh, elections for representatives and for some senators uh, every, every, every two years. And that, that, that structure is basically in, pl in place. But that within that structure, there's a tremendous amount of latitude and that the particular meanings of um, our uh, of, of the Constitution are fleshed out through Supreme Court decisions, and there, it happens over time. And sometimes he calls it a, a, a living um, constitutionalism or framework originalism, or you know, he has various things. Uh, but I like that idea, that the, that the, the, that the founders uh, established a framework that they then gave to subsequent generations, and it's the role of those subsequent generations to kind of work through the problems however they see fit, which might even mean changing the Constitution, but nevertheless continuing the process of uh, American political development. What about that point of changing the Constitution? We are yeah. here yeah. at this beautiful institution, and it's, it, it tends to be um, very controversial. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sandy Levenstein, for example, and Larry Sabato, a lawyer and a historian, th there are professors in this choir that the dysfunction mm -hmm. um, and what you suggest in the subtitle, um, the inflexibility, inflexibility right? Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ask what would Jefferson do. <laughs> if, if Jefferson thought it would be useful to, I'm tempted. Yeah. But um, how do we embark on that decision-making process when it, it seems like the rigor of our public discourse uh, is not going to satisfy the require the basic mm -hmm. requirement for having enough knowledge as as a citizenry to be able to convene a new constitutional convention. Yeah. But yet it's it would be so inspiring. How, how do you weigh I mean, in on this? Um, and, and and bring in the history as you as yeah, you want. Yeah. I mean, so you know, Levinson is an interesting uh, character. He's a he's a law professor at University of Texas at Austin, and he's he's among the foremost proponents of a new constitution. And and what he argues is that the 18th century constitution is fundamentally flawed in lots of ways, and that a lot of the pathologies of modern politics arise out of trying to live under a document that's now two two centuries old. And he makes some compelling cases. Um, for example, that the um, the, the Senate, which is a fundamentally anti-democratic institution by design, uh, is, um, uh, can never be changed under the provisions of, of uh, the U.S. Constitution. That was sort of written in at the last minute. And so you can't even by amendment say we want to uh, apportion representation of the, in the Senate in a truly representative manner. You have to have a new constitutional convention. Um, and I think he, he, he makes some interesting points. Um, I mentioned this to some of my, uh, my, my uh, colleagues at, at an event that I had one time. And, um, and I said, you know, he, he, he has some good arguments. And he said, can you imagine, and the colleague that I was talking to said, could you imagine what would come out of a constitutional convention that we convened today? That is utterly insane. And, um, you know, right. it, it might be. but. Wouldn't it be an interesting exercise? I mean, I don't think anybody would have imagined that. But, but uh, to Sandy, and thank you for giving yeah. the audience proper context on that. <laughs> I apologize for uh, omitting. But Sandy has a, has a um, savvier answer than that, right? He, what, not just that it would be an exercise. No. He, 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 does he not? He, he, <laughs> no. He, well, I, as far as I know, he... He has graduate students, um, or whenever he teaches a law class, they, they sit around and they come up with their own kind of version right. of the Constitution. And I think he's more optimistic than I am about what would emerge from that. Well, let's talk about that because <laughs> one misappropriation, but I think, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, accurate um, quotation of Jefferson's was about a, a new yeah. rebellion. You right. Know, what, what was it precisely? Every. Yeah. Every, uh, uh, X, like, X decades, it was like, X years. It was something like every 20 years, right. you know, we need a new but revolution. So, so, um, so how do you assess, that is a, a mantra of the Tea Party. Yeah. So how, if the Tea Party employed its energies to 
coming up with a new constitution. Right, then yeah. you, know, you might see some of the outcomes you're projecting, but I'm, I'm wondering, because that quote, maybe more than any other Jefferson quote, mm -hmm. has had the most traction right. in this contemporary political climate. Yeah. Um, the Tea Party, I'll confess, it doesn't, uh, as a political movement, make much sense to me. Because on the one hand, um, they, they do kind of invoke this revolutionary idea that you see from Jefferson. And, and, and um, many of the, the leaders of the Tea Party conceive of their movement as a reclamation of this revolutionary spirit. And at the same time, they um, uh, have this very nostalgic view of, of, of the past. It's like they're nostalgic revolutionaries or something like that. And as a, as a kind of uh, uh, intellectual posture, that, that doesn't really make a whole lot of uh, sense to me. But I would love it if, if the Tea Party, um, if, if there was a Tea Party convention sometime and they sat around and said, you know, what, what do we want our, a new constitution to look like? And, and, I, and I think it would be the constitution without all the amendments. Um, certainly without the, you know, the 17th Amendment, which allowed for the direct election of U.S. Senators. I know that many Tea Party proponents um, are, are opposed to that. Um, oh, but they just want the Bill of Rights and no Constitution? Or it's, it's, it's a conundrum because uh, you referred to Jefferson as a farmer. Um, you know, there was, did Jefferson have a corporate o overlord? <laughs> no, right? I mean, no. no. And, and th again, this is a nonpartisan institution, and this is not a partisan point because the Democratic Party and, right. and, and certainly Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation have yeah. overlords, right? Yeah. Right. Um, as does the Tea Party. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it just goes to the, the fundamental incoherence of, of references to the Founding Fathers. I mean, um, I was working on this book in 2012 when Barack Obama was elected, and I, I remember listening to his um, uh, acceptance speech on, on the night of his, his re-election, and he said something to the effect of, you know, uh, now we can go about uh, uh, achieving the dream of the Founding Fathers, the idea that it doesn't matter, you know, who you are or where you come from or who you love, a kind of, you know, gesture to... to, to um, gay rights, uh, but you know America has a place for you. And I thought, like, the founding fathers, I mean, a plurality of them owned slaves, you know, and would not believe that Barack Obama, as a black man, could be president of the United States. And so there is this just um, a really uh, deep level of historical malapropism every time right. a, a, a politician or a political activist references the founding fathers, and it kind of goes, you know. All ways, um, Republican, Democrat, uh, it, it's often um, uh, very confused. Not, not a, enough Democrats acknowledge, though, both in Bill Clinton's administration and in the present administration, the fact that the, tri the triangulation um, led very much forward the Reagan revolution, if you will, which maybe we shouldn't call the Reagan Revolution because if the Revolution of 1800 and then later with Jackson were the real revolutions, then um, Roosevelt's was an aberration, not mm -hmm. a revolution. Mm -hmm. and, 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 shouldn't, you know, and, and Reagan's uh, was you know, furthering the, the real origin story. But my, point, my pointer question um, in, in the context of this last audience question about uh, who, someone who arrived late and wanted to know what the Jefferson rule was. Uh, how do you see um, Clinton and, and, and Obama fitting into this story of, uh, I think you just told us how you see Obama. He was a perfect vehicle through which the message could be anything, right? That's, yeah. that's how he was elected in 2008, right. change. Right. A very abstract concept. And hope. Right, and hope, and, and certainly he's um, been more progressive than conservative in executing policy, yeah. sure, but it was Clinton who said the era of big government is over. over. Yeah. And, and so if, if that wasn't uh, you know, paying homage to Jefferson, I don't know what, what yeah. would be. Well, you know, I think what you see often, I mean, I as much as I'm, I'm critical of, of, of both sides, they, they do differ. And, and what you see, um, they, they approach the Founding Fathers in different ways. And you see this with, with, with Obama, and you see this with the Tea Party. Conservatives tend to uh, approach the Founding Fathers um, with a kind of um, 
fundamentalist literalism. That is that the founding fathers had, uh, and I don't mean that negatively, that they, they literally established fundamentals to the nation and that it is, uh, those fundamentals are unchanging and that we need as much as possible to maintain those fundamentals, otherwise the nation goes into decline. You see, uh, liberals, and, and this makes sense of, of Obama and also of, of, um, of, of Bill Clinton, um, you see them up approaching it in, in a different way. That is, that, that the founding fathers established a certain set of principles, whether they believed it or not, whether they lived up to it or not, the principle of equality and liberty, for example, and that those principles change over time and grow in meaning, divorced from the founding fathers themselves. And so in, in, in each instance, what you see is, is invocations of the founders, but they approach the founding fathers in different ways. And you see conservatives most often using the founding fathers to, to, to say, we've departed from those principles and we need to go back. And you see uh, liberals invoking the founding fathers as sort of establishing a set of ideals that we need to live up to in some ways. And in both cases, though, what you see is um, the founding fathers agree with whoever it is that's, that's invoking them in, in, the, in the present. So even though they sort of use different interpretive um, roots, they, they wind up in basically the same place, which is the founding fathers agree with me, and that's why uh, we should install my, my policy. And I think we just have a couple more minutes, but for our audience, uh, this is a terrific book. Um, Thank I you. think you'd enjoy it even if, if you are not a historian by training or like history books because it's quite an exciting narrative. Uh, but finally, we said before Jefferson's quote, Benjamin Franklin, join mm -hmm. for your die, but uh, it, it, I'm always interested in the unsung kind of rule. If there was another, we mentioned Hamilton and, and uh, and Adams before, but in the process of writing this book, was mm -hmm. there a, was there a founder whose that um, I like? The, well, <laughs> right. <laughs> was it was there was there a founder maybe who you like? Sure, yeah. but was there a founder who, um, you know, was was uh, setting a rule that would breed flexibility as opposed to inflexibility? Um, so, and I, I was joking, of course, I, I like all the founders, I wouldn't spend <laughs> four years of my life reading about them and their uses if I, you know, didn't, didn't like them in some way. But, um, but, but I, I, I am asking, is there a founder that you naturally gravitate to? And um, I, I usually say Benjamin Franklin, and I say that not just because we're in Philadelphia, but because um, think, he's almost an apolitical founder. Like it's impossible to, to use him in a kind of a politically meaningful way. What you think about the founder, what, what you think about Franklin, and, and it, it's sort of what I would like us to think about all the founders, is his unique individuality and his audio, utter idiosyncrasy, sync, sync, help me out there, idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy in, in, in his own time. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the thing about the founding fathers is, you know, if, if you read very deeply into their papers, and I've read deeper than I might have imagined in, in, in their papers, is that they are all thoroughly unique uh, 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 people that um, when you kind of really wrestle with their uniqueness, when you kind of really recognize the degree to which they lived in a particular moment and that moment is now gone, I mean, it kind of, um, like, like all kind of people of the past, I'd love to know them, um, but I don't want to see them in political debate. <laughs> to be continued, uh, maybe a Franklin rule. But for now, the <laughs> Jefferson rule, I encourage you all to pick it up. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you. you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Well, that was so fun. Now, signing books. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> I did. <laughs>